Good morning, everybody. Morning. So glad you're here today. We got a special day today. We have a special guest hailing all the way from Britain today. Woo-hoo! So her and her husband came in, uh, I think, on Friday. It's been a couple of days with us. We had uh, a Thursday or Friday, and uh, this is someone that I met early on in ministry. I was a part of New Life Bible College early on. I went to school there and became an instructor later on. And this is a lady that came through, and her inspiration was so powerful. Her teaching was so dynamic. And uh, over the years, I've had an opportunity to go back to England, go be a participant in the church where she was a part of uh, that staff there. And, and her daughter is actually, her daughter was almost going to move over here a couple years back. And, uh, but you're going to be so blessed today. She's got a strong gift. She's been in pastoral ministry. She's been a teacher. Uh, she's been married for 53 years to four different men. No, no, I'm sorry, just one. Her husband's here, Alan. You'll get a chance to meet him today. He's a blessing. Uh, but would you give an oasis welcome to me to Jan Obrich as she comes to share with us today? Good morning. I'm so blessed to be here. Turn to somebody and say, God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Turn to someone else and say, God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. I, I love that. I love that God loves us. Well, this morning, um, I apologize before we start that if I say anything that doesn't translate well, just know that, you know, I'm not meaning to cause offense, okay? That I love you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. That's right. I couldn't find the mic at the beginning. I didn't know where it had gone. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah. Um, um, this morning, I'm going to share a message that was kind of inspired by an event in my life. Uh, But before we begin, let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we exalt you, we glorify you, we honor you. We thank you, Lord God, that your word is quick and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, that it could divide for us that which is soul and that which is spirit. And I thank you, Lord, that today you will minister truths to us that will change our lives, that it will not just be a question of tickled ears, but it will be something that will change us from glory to glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, last year sometime, um, I, had, I had suffered for years, um, and as I share this, I'm conscious that I started getting um, a bit of a cold as I, on the plane, and my throat is sounding less than perfect. And, uh, and, and I thought it's typical of the devil because what I'm going to share with you is to do with that. About 12 years ago, I started to lose my voice. It got to the stage where um, I couldn't sing anymore at all. I mean, I would just go, <laughs> you know. Um, and it was affecting my teaching, my preaching. So... Um, uh, it was something I was kind of aware of, but I, I, and I was believing God. I was speaking the word. I believed for healing. Um, and I, um, I, I was worshiping in, I think, probably October, November. Kelly, my daughter, was um, singing on Saturday evening at a worship service, and I was preaching on Sunday morning. And as I was in the worship service, I was, had my hands raised, and I was croaking out, You know, and in my head, I said, oh, Lord, I just want to be able to worship you like I used to. And he said to me, you have never received your healing. I thought, okay, I've been speaking it. I've been confessing it. I've been telling people. But then I saw myself in my head. I saw myself several weeks before the senior pastor and his wife were sitting on a couple of chairs and I was standing in front of them and he was a pop singer in the 70s, a Christian pop singer, so has a great voice still. His son is our worship pastor, great voice. His other son is in our worship team, great voice. His daughter runs a a ministry called I Sing Pop, great voice. So I was saying to him, I, see, what I did was I took the wisdom of men because I went and got it checked out. And they showed me a picture. They said, your vocal cords are damaged. And where most people's vocal cords close, yours don't. So nothing you do about it, you know, just um, that's it. So I said to him, 
I really miss singing because my vocal cords are damaged. And God just showed me that, flashed back to that in that moment, in that worship service. And I repented because I knew that I had never seen myself healed. I had spoken it. I believed the word, but I had in my in my mind, I still had a picture of me with damaged vocal cords. In that moment, I said, I will never again confess anything except my vocal cords are, are healed. I'm, I'm perfectly fine. And God said to me, you've not used your vocal cords properly for a long time. Now you need to strengthen them. So he told me to do some exercises to get to the place where I could build them up. And now, when I'm about to, when I tell you that, <coughs> I'm all croaky. But the croakiness is to do with the cold and nothing to do with the vocal cords. So Romans 12, this is a scripture that everyone knows. And, uh, and when I went to this again, I thought, what can I get from this that I haven't already got? Because, you know, it's, it, everyone knows it. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Um, and most commentators or many commentators say that these are the most powerful two verses in the Bible. So I'll let you judge that for yourself. But first of all, and I'm reading from the King James because that's where I studied it from. Um, so I apologize for that, right? Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So... I'm going to kind of skip through the first verse quite quickly, but I think it's good to have a background. First of all, it says, I beseech. That means I'm pleading with you. I'm making a strong request of you. Uh, this is not him just saying, if you feel like it. He's saying, I urge you. It's a, a very powerful word. I urge you, brethren. So he's not talking to unbelievers here. He's talking to people who know God. But as I looked at this, I thought, you know what? Some people like I was. I accepted Jesus as my saviour when I was seven. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And be, uh, well, I didn't say Lord, I just asked him to come into my heart. And I know that if I died, I would have gone to heaven. But I didn't make Jesus Lord until I was 19. And there's a difference. See, there's a lot of people accept him as saviour. They know they've got a ticket to heaven, but he's never in control of the lives. And that's how it was with me. And when I made him Lord, it changed everything. And so this is kind of where Paul is when he's talking here. He's saying, I want you to be um, set apart when he talks about your bodies being a living sacrifice. Set apart for the master's use. Set apart a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, sacrifices were dead. But in the new covenant, he wants us to be living sacrifices. You know, some people say um, it's easier to die for Christ than it is to live for him. Right? Oh, yeah, I'll die for Jesus. Yeah, but will you live for Jesus? Because living for him, it means you've got to, give, you've got to knowingly, willingly yield, give yourself as a sacrifice and say, like Jesus did to the Father. He said, not my will, but yours. Not what I want, but what you want. And how many of us can say that every day in every way, that it's not my will but yours? So often we have little pieces of our lives that are kind of ring-fenced. You can have all this lot, God, but this bit's mine. This bit's what I want. This bit's, this bit's what I want to keep. And so we need to be aware of that in our lives and come to a place where we can say, I'm ready to lay that on the altar. I'm ready to, uh, to submit to your will, Lord, so that uh, I can be that living sacrifice. He says it's, um, it's actually um, a reasonable service. Reasonable. So he's not asking you anything that's outside of what's right here. And the question I, I say to people is, have you discovered a reason to, to make him Lord yet? Have you discovered a reason to say, give it to him? Because in James, James 4, 7, which um, um, I've not brought my paper Bible, so I'm going through my phone. I, I'm trying to save weight, um, but <laughs> not my weight, uh, but for my husband to carry. Right? 
It says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. A lot of us want to resist the devil. We're like, oh, yeah, get thee behind me, Satan. But have we submitted to God? Because that's lordship. Submitting to God is making him lord. And unless he's lord, then what power do you have? Submit to God, then resist the devil. And he'll flee from you in terror. Not just he'll run away, but he'll flee in terror from you. So if you want the devil to flee, then we need to come to that place where he's Lord. He says, in, he says him, I appeal to you, is what he's saying in Romans 12. I appeal to you to make him Lord. That means to listen to reason. And it's a process. He's saying, um, it, and that means it's an urging you to come over to my side, is what the Greek word there means. So listening to reason and then making a choice. Listen to reason that make a choice. And so often we don't listen to reason because we've got God in a little box that sits in our, our lives. And we say, this is where he fits. This is the bit that God has. Oh, yes, I'm going to church on Sunday and I lift my hands and I praise. But uh, the rest of my life is kind of mine. We, we consider it like the tithe, right? Right? You know, some people believe 10% belongs to God and 90% belongs to you. And they do that with their time and their attention. 10% belongs to God and the rest is mine. Well, let me tell you, you're wrong. It both counts. Right? 100% belongs to God. A tithe is just a, a, a guide. But it's not because 90% belongs to you. It's because 100% belongs to God and you give him the tithe as a first fruit, which is a representation. And the same with your lives. When we give Jesus our lives, we're saying, 100% of me belongs to you, Lord. Which bit do you want me to, to have for me? None. <laughs> right? And with my money, which bit do you want me to have? None. You do with it what I tell you to. Now, obviously, you've got to pay your bills and all that kind of stuff. But he says you can do that. But it's his money. It's his life. My life is his life. And that's Lord. See, um, when I was worshipping and I said, I want to be able to worship you, the Lord reminded me that actually music, singing, that's not worship. That's not worship. That's the instrument of worship. Worship, true worship, is yielding to the Lordship of Jesus. That's true worship. And so the expression of that is what we sing. But that's not true worship. Jesus said that those that, Follow me, will worship me in spirit and in truth. And yes, it's great. I love to sing and dance and, and all that stuff. But that's not the worship. So you can be doing that on the outside, but it's on the inside that you're worshiping. It's not about what you do on the outside. Anybody can lift their hands and dance and sing. Anyone. Right? But it's what's on in the inside of you. That's the true worship. Uh, so the offering in the Old Testament was outside of yourself. In the New Testament, it is yourself. So, um, in the Old Testament, I said it was, you were, it was dead. Now we're alive. He says, I appeal to you, therefore. Well, therefore, when you see a therefore, you better figure out what is therefore. So, <laughs> um, and so he's, he's talking about a couple of verses which are before Romans 12. And so, when you're in Romans 12, you have to go back a few verses um, and it's, let's just go to the last verse of chapter 11, because I'm mindful of time. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Because of that, because of that, because he's Lord, because he, he created everything, because he's Lord of all, because he's the, the God of the universe, because of all that, because of who he is, not because of what he's done, but because of who he is, therefore... As a result of that, because of that, submit your bodies, a living sacrifice. Present your bodies, a living sacrifice. In light of everything that he's done, in light of all of who he is, make him Lord. Um, holy and acceptable is another good reason. It's holy and acceptable to God. Right? And it's reasonable. So um, Peter talks about being living stones, doesn't he? talks about we're living stones, that he builds us up into a temple. And we're part of that building, which is Christ. 
See, we're not separate from Christ. When you, are, uh, in, when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become Christ and he becomes you. He wants to live his life in you, as you, and through you. He's not a separate little something that sits on the inside of you and has a little word in your ear now and again. He wants to become you as you become him. It's a total unity. It's a, I can't get away from Christ any more than he wants to get away from me. Well, because we're one, we're, we're together. There's a, a word in um, Hebrew, and I know I'm not saying it correctly because I heard them say it correctly last night. And I, I call it eshat, and it's not that. As somebody that's Jewish might be able to correct me. I apologize for my Hebrew and Greek all the time. Um, but it means a compound unity, and it's the word that's used of God, the, the three persons. It's the word that's used to describe a marriage relationship, a husband and wife. What it means is there's more than one part that becomes one. So three persons, one God. Compound is not a mixture. Husband and wife, compound, the two become one flesh. Eshad, it means this compound unity. You are one, and yet... The individual parts are still discernible. They're still individual. You don't lose your personality when you get married. You don't lose yourself in your partner. You're still yourself, but together you're stronger because you're this eshad, this compound unity. And, and that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about being um, a compound unity with him. So then he says, don't be conformed to this world. Well, I, I thought, okay, let me look at what conformity is in the dictionary. And it says, compliance with standards. I hate that word, compliance. I work in finance and compliance are like, you know, compliance. Don't be conformed. Compliance with standards, rules, or laws, conformity by regulations, behavior in accordance with socially accepted conventions, a word of praise or an encouraging smile provides rewards for conformity to social norms. So if you're, con if you're conforming, <coughs> everybody, everybody smiles at you, everyone likes you, but conformity, living to a certain standard, Paul is saying, don't be conformed to this world. Now, I hear preaching about, you know, you've got to be, you, you can't be kind of worldly. You've got to, um, you know, be holy, not do the world things. That's not quite what he's talking about here. He's talking about the, the way of life. He's talking about the, the, the world system. The world system is not run by God. You do know that, right? He handed the keys over to Adam, who handed them over to Satan. So Satan is the God of this world. People go, why does God let this happen? Well, because he's not ruling this world. The only people he's ruling in the world is you and me, if we're in Christ. One day, he'll come back to rule and reign. But in the meantime, the devil is the God of this world. And so his system, the system of the world, doesn't belong to our God. So he's saying, don't conform to this world. Don't live by the, the, the system that is here. So I, I thought, okay, so why shouldn't we? In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says the God of this world has blinded. There's a few good reasons here why we shouldn't conform to the world. It says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. People's minds are blinded. If we conform to the world, then we can fall into a place where our minds get blinded. He wants to blind our minds. He wants us to be in a situation where we don't hear God, where we just listen to what's norm in the world. And the church is very slowly, or maybe not so slowly, heading in that direction because they don't realize that conforming to the world system is not cool. It's not cool. We can now, we can dress like the world. It's nothing to do with how you dress. You know, I used to have a rule in our church, so long as you can't see up it, down it, or through it, you're all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can dress how you like. I love the fact that you can dress up or you can dress down. I love that. I lo I, there's nothing to do with fashion. And some people are very legalistic and say, oh, no, you know, you're not allowed to, women are allowed to wear church. There used to be a time when I preached in America 
where I would not have been allowed to preach in trousers, pants, okay? Because women did not do that. I remember getting ready to go and preach at Benny Hinn's church in Florida, and the lady I was staying with, I'd put a, a suit up, and it was a beautiful trouser suit, and she said, you weren't planning on wearing that to preach, were you? I'm like, well, yeah. And she said, they won't hear you. Your, your dress will be shouting too loud. So I changed my plans and wore, wore a dress or a skirt. But I, I wear pants all the time. But there was a time when that would have been considered dressing like the world. Now, that's not what God's talking about here. So the second thing is in 1 Corinthians 3.19. This is why we shouldn't conform to the world. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Um, but we all... With open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. I love that scripture, but I don't think that's what it was. <laughs> so, it was, oh, that's because I'm in two Corinthians instead of one. I thought, oh, that sounds nice, but that's not what I was looking at. <laughs> See, you don't have to be brainy to be a, a minister. It says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness. With God, for it's written, He hath taken the wise in their own craftiness. The wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. That's why we don't want to conform to the world. We don't want to be like the world because their wisdom is not wise, it's foolish. Now, if you need any more reasons not to conform to the world, there's loads of them. I've just got a few. In 1 Corinthians 7 31, there's a, another good reason. Let's see if I've got the right scripture on this one. Um, it says, and they that use this world, as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. The world system is going to go. The world's fashions change. The world is going to pass away. It's not going to last forever. God is going to bring a new heaven and a new earth. We're not going to be in this world. So this world system is failing. It's totally failing. We can't depend on it. It changes from one day to the next, doesn't it? And have you noticed how much fear there is in the world? The fear, you know, in, in the pandemic that's just gone, people were feared, fearing for their lives. Yet we as believers, what's the worst that can happen? You go home to be with the Lord, right? We've got no fear. We shouldn't have any fear. Um, I know there are still people that in the church who are fearful. People that are, are listening to the world. You know, I, I've got a lady who sends me texts all the time with videos on. All this conspiracy stuff. You know, all this stuff that this is all happening and this is all happening. It's come from this and it's come from that. And I'm like, who cares? <laughs> Seriously, who cares? <laughs> My God's in control. I don't have to worry about whether whether it came from China or Russia or wherever else. I don't have to worry about that. Oh, well, it's a conspiracy because, you know, the governments are trying to make money. You know, I don't know about you, but our government spent billions that we're paying for now. So, you know, uh, I don't think it was that. But the bottom line is we've got to not be careful. And I'm using that word carefully. <laughs> we've, got to be, we've not got to be careful, full of care of these things because God is in control. All I kept saying throughout the whole pandemic was, God's got this. God's got this. We don't know. And now we know there's been a lot of shaking. But you know what? It needs shaking. The church has been shaken all over the world. It needed shaking. You know, we've got to stop being complacent and get off our blessed assurances and do something. Right? See, this week, you've already been challenged by, by Pastor Billy to get out there and invite people to come next Sunday, to Easter Sunday. Do you know there's three, I think, two main times in the, in the calendar that people will come with alacrity to church. One is Easter and one is Christmas. They come because even if they are not a believer, they kind of believe. They believe that, you know, 
God's somebody up there. And these are special days. So you want to get somebody in church? That's the time to get them here. That's the time to invite them because that's when they're open to come. Um, the, another scripture in 1 John 2, it says, I'm really proud of myself for getting all these scriptures in, in, in my tags, in my Bible here. It says, um, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. If those are not good reasons to shun the system of the world, I don't know what it is to be not conformed. Do you know what? Conforming is, or non-conformity is not really the issue. Non-conformity is not enough. Oh, well, I don't conform to the world. Yeah, but that's only half the story. Because if you, just because you don't conform to the world, it doesn't mean that you're conforming to Christ. Not conforming with the world is just the beginning. There are loads of people that don't conform. The Amish, they don't conform, do they? They don't use electricity and they still ride horses and cars. They make their own clothes, ugly clothes. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? you know. I mean, you know, I know, I know that God would not stop me wearing jewelry. I know that. And I know it wouldn't stop me having shoes. My husband calls me Melda Marcos sometimes. <laughs> but I, because I do like shoes. Um, but uh, I know God, I know that God loves me too much to make me uh, do that, to please him. Because he's not worried about the outside. He's worried about the inside. It's the heart that he's concerned about. And, uh, you know, you can dress however you like. As long as it's not offending other people. Like I said, can't see up it, down it, or through it. Um, so there's a testing. It says there's a testing that you may discern. That means that you'll, you'll know. So back to Romans 12. Um, oops. These nails are great, except when you're trying to do something on your phone. <laughs> it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. So if we're not going to be conformed like the Amish or the Pharisees, they weren't conformed, were they? My goodness, be transformed um, by the renewing of your mind. That's the word metamorphio. It means to change in the form or nature of a thing or person by natural or supernatural means. That means that we're going to be totally transformed. Don't conform, but you've got to go the step for, further and be transformed. Let Christ do the work in us. Now, it's not us that do it. You know, we, we're not like an apple tree where you stick the apples on the outside. Right? That doesn't make good apples. You've got to be rooted and grounded and planted in the soil of God's love, his word. Then you will produce good fruit. It's not what you do, it's what he does in you. Stop struggling and striving. You don't have to struggle and strive because it's what he does. It's a gradual ongoing process. It's not, it's not a physical thing. It's, it's in our minds. Now, we're being transformed. That means gradually from one degree of glory to another, being changed into the image of Christ. And it's renewing the mind. Now, he talks about renewing the mind. That means we change the way we think. Simple, you might say. But I realized that I, was try I wasn't really changing the way I was thinking. I was saying it. I was believing because I knew the word is true and that my healing was paid for at Calvary. I knew all that. I was speaking it, but I hadn't transformed my mind. I hadn't renewed my mind because the picture I held in my mind was the old picture. It needed to be reset. And I started to think about this and I started to realize that God speaks a lot about seeing things. He speaks about vision. He speaks about seeing. And so I thought, you know what? How do we, how do we formulate ideas? We, we get pictures. Now, I'm, God created our brains, right? And you've got two sides to your brain, a left side and a right side. The left side of your brain is kind of a logical side. That's words. That's um, it's um, theory. Uh, it's um, sums and stuff like that. The right side of your brain is creative. It's pictures. Now, if you're a right-brained person, then naturally you will begin to see things. You know, if if I say to you. Um, 
you know, imagine a black dog, right? Then you can probably imagine a black dog. But if you've got to start imagining yourself, and imagination, God gave us imagination. He, he gave us a Holy Ghost imagination. He said he can do above and beyond all that we can ask or imagine. So the imagination is from God. We have to start imagining ourselves the way God sees us, see ourselves as God sees us. So I started to think, how do I do that? And I'd done a bit of study on, on the brain, and I realized that I'm very left-brained. So I had to do what the Bible says, actually, and I realized that over the years I'd done it, but not necessarily very successfully in some ways, and that is um, speak, hear, believe. Out of, out of the abundance of the heart, the man speaks, but faith comes by hearing. And I also realized many years ago that you believe you before you'll believe anyone else. You know, pastor can say to you, you're healed. And you go, oh yeah, but I still feel sick. Right? So you believe you, you go, oh yes, amen, thank you pastor, praise God, yeah, hallelujah, but I'm still sick. Right? One day it might happen, I might get healed but I still feel sick. So you've got to change that because you've got to line your thinking up, the pictures in your mind with what God says. And so I realized that if I've got to speak it, then I, I can tap into some secrets of the brain. And, you know, without getting too scientific, there's, uh, you've got a, a gatekeeper in your brain um, called a RAS, R-A-S, and that kind of is the gateway to your brain. It protects you, but it also protects you from getting truth if it doesn't agree with it. You know, it says, well, last time I believed this, it didn't happen. Right? So I won't, be, I won't believe that this time because it didn't happen last time. So you've got to get past the rats, and the way you do that is that you relax. Now, sounds crazy, right? But relax. Do you remember when you used to daydream when you were a kid? You know, you'd be sitting there in class when you're supposed to be doing maths and daydream. And your teacher told you off? No, that was when you were at your most creative. When you were daydreaming, you weren't really here, you were somewhere else. And if you relax, you know that time in the morning where you're just waking up and you, you're, you know what's going on around you, but you don't care yet. You know what I mean? That's the time God often speaks, isn't it? At that moment, God often gives me revelation or gives me scriptures right in that moment or just before you go to sleep. You're just dozing. You can still hear what's going on, but yeah, you just, you're, not, you're not really in the world anymore, right? That moment, that's when your, your brain is most receptive. So at that point, you can choose what you feed your brain. So you can either take the word of God, and I, I told this to a few people, take uh, something, your phone, and speak the word personally personalize it and speak it onto a recorder. Record yourself speaking the end result. Speak the scripture. I am the healed. Right? Not I'm going to be. I'm walking in the, the healing that Jesus paid for at Calvary or whatever it is, whatever it is. I don't walk in fear. I walk in faith. I have no fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear does not reside in me. Fear is not my friend. I'm, I'm courageous, I'm bold. Do you see what I mean? Right? And so get those, those things onto a recorder and then just play it. When you wake up in the morning, just play it. Just play it before you go to sleep and start to visualize. You know, we've made that, the world's made that into a very off word, visualization. You know, I'm not talking meditating on a doorknob, you know. <laughs> I'm talking about meditating on the Word of God and letting God create the picture of you the way he sees you. When you agree with what God sees, then you'll get the manifestation of what it is you're believing for. I don't know, some of you may be like me, that you're confessing and you're believing and you're saying and you, you know it's true, but you still haven't seen the manifestation. Could it be that you still picture yourself different? You still picture yourself sick. Could it be that? Could it be that you're not sure what, what to do? Well, hopefully, that's a little bit of uh, um, information. But of course, it could be that you don't know Jesus at all. Could be that you haven't taken that first step. You can't, so you can't do this yourself. 
You can't be changed by your own power. You've got to be changed by the redeeming power of Jesus. And so there may be some of you in here right now that have never taken that step to make Jesus Lord. It's very simple. You don't make it complicated. He said, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he's Lord, then you'll be saved. Simple. You go, yeah, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm good enough for God. Oh, hallelujah. Because none of us are. None of us are. Yeah, but maybe I can change a bit first. No, he doesn't want you to do that. He wants to do it for you. He wants to take your life and change it for the better. We sang in one of the songs that he's never let us down. He's never let us down. He's never let me down. In 52 years, 51 years, 51 years, yeah, he's never let me down, never. And all it took was for me to say, okay, Jesus, I'll give you a go. I'll, 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 I'll let you come in. So I'm just going to pray a prayer and just alongside me, if this is you, if you are feeling like, you know what, I'd like to just try Jesus, then just pray along with me in your head. And then afterwards, you can speak to someone. Let them know what you said, what you did, because that's the next step. And then you'll be part of the family, coming into the family. And that's what it is. It's a family. If you haven't got that just by being in this auditorium this morning, then uh, I don't know when you get it, because this is such a family atmosphere, coming into the family of Christ. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you right now for every person in this auditorium, especially that have not yet received you as their Lord and Savior. Right now, Lord... We commit them to you and we say, Lord Jesus, come into the lives of those who are crying out on the inside and change them. Change them from glory to glory. Change them into the person that you see them as. Start showing them that the, the person you see is perfect. The person you see is restored. The person you see is healed. The person you see is not stuck in sin, they're clean and whole because of what you will do, what you already did at Calvary, and what you will work out in them and through them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Jan, uh, for sharing with us and reminding us, man, the word is what transforms us, right? It, it is what we need to be transformed, not just not conforming, but being transformed is a work of the spirit by the word of God. So I want to invite you. We're going to do some baptisms right now, a very special time at our church every time. And if you haven't been baptized, you would consider saying, you know, what, I'd like to get baptized today. Where's Q at? Where are you at, Q?